I've spent the last <clears throat> several months studying the topic of women in ministry and forgetting to turn my lights on as well. <laughs> anyway, here they are. This, the last several months have been spent uh, really devoting my time to the topic of women in ministry. It's a, I think it's a very important issue. I think it's heavy. I think it hits your hearts, especially you ladies. It hits your lives in a really big way. This actually hurt my YouTube channel. I don't know if anybody noticed, but <laughs> this devoting my time to this and doing many less videos, a lot of videos I would have done I didn't do because it just took so long. I had to read so much content. There was so much debate on this. And you're going to see, you likely have no idea how much debate there is among scholars and lay people on this topic. And we're going to delve right into it. We're going to get into all of the issues, look at everything the Bible teaches about it. This is going to be a series because there's so many different issues. And so this is the introduction. This first video, I'll get deep into major issues today, but it also serves as an introduction. I want you to know what you're getting into with this topic of women in ministry. So to remind you, in case you don't know, I'm Mike Winger. I'm a pastor in Southern California. I devote myself to trying to learn how to think biblically about everything so that I could pr 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 uh, provide teaching content, excuse me as I stutter, so that you can learn how to think biblically about everything. My goal is not just to make you hear me declare what is true about things, but rather enable you with the tools and the information so that you can process things, so that you become better at thinking biblically on your own. That's the agenda here. And I'm going to approach this series the same way. So I'm entering into a massive, massive debate on this topic. People are well entrenched on both sides. And there is, it is a battleground, the topic of women in ministry. I'm not going to treat it that way. We're going to treat this as a topic to understand, to evaluate, to consider and think about biblically, be aware of the people on both sides and treat them as our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the approach we're going to have here. But let me talk now about the biggest problem, the biggest issue. This is the biggest issue in the entire debate. And I'm going to talk about the, this. Is today's video is going to focus on this. Before we can get into deep biblical discussions, before we can approach the Bible, we have to ask ourselves, do we have rules that we're using to bypass the scripture entirely? And I, I, I mean that very, very literally. There's, there's rules or little policies or beliefs that people are having when they approach the debate of women in ministry that causes them to not even be able to think biblically. That, that is, no matter what the Bible says, it simply doesn't matter because they're making these huge mistakes before they read the Bible that don't let them read the Bible properly. I think this is probably the biggest issue in the women in ministry debate. And it's also why the tensions are so high in the discussion on a secondary issue. This is not about the gospel. This is not about being saved. It's not about simply trusting in Christ. And it, this is a secondary topic, but the tensions are very high. So this is the biggest problem. We're going to talk about phil philosophical or rhetorical or tradition mistakes, uh, stories of church hurt mistakes, fears of modern feminism mistakes. These are all major mistakes we can make that color the way we approach the Bible and don't let us read it properly. So I'm going to get into seven in particular, seven huge mistakes and a few other things as well today. Um, now, just to frame the debate, for anybody who doesn't know, there's two different sides. Uh, you're going to need to know these words. Uh, I'm going to use these words a lot, right? Complementarian and egalitarian. The, the different sides represent two, two different views. Now, within those views, there's variety. But the two different views are the complementarian view, which holds that women and men are equal in value, but they have different roles. And so there's different functions that they have either in the home or in particular for today's discussion in this series in the church. So an example of a complementarian view that pretty much all complementarians agree on is that women are not supposed to be in the role of elder in the local church. Then there's debate on what other things they can do or should or shouldn't do. And then the egalitarian view, egalitarian coming from the word like equal, right? That, that there's this equality in person and in role. And there is no limit regarding authority. There's no limit to what a woman should or shouldn't do in the church. So women can be elders or anything else for that matter. So the two words, complementarian, they use this term because they're trying to say we have complementary and different callings, but we're equal in value and, and purpose and dignity and things like that. The egalitarian saying, no, 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 there's complete equality across the board in not only person, but also in functions. And so we're going to dig into those issues. Um, how I view this topic is this. This is also important for me to lay this out. Um, I don't like doing a lot of introductory comments, but for today's video, I got to. I got to. In, in the following videos, you're just, we're just going to get straight to the meat of that topic, that video. Today's the introduction. Today's framing the discussion in a way that I hope will be helpful for you. And that's the whole point, to help you. So this is a secondary issue. This is the first thing I want to say about it. <laughs> this is totally a secondary issue, by which I mean, wherever you fall on this topic, you're still a Christian. Okay? <laughs> Whatever. This is not... Look, sincere believers whose, whose walk with Jesus, I do not question. They are on both sides of this issue. And I mean that very genuinely. I'm not, I'm not afraid to throw down a gauntlet and say on this topic, like 
this is not secondary. Like this is, this is, I will die on this hill. Like I'm not going to die on the hill of women in ministry. This, I'm just, I'm not, but I realize it's important. So we're going to talk about it. So there are believers on both sides, genuinely seeking to honor Jesus. And even if some of them are wrong, I still don't think it's worth dividing over. I don't think it's worth dividing over. I don't think I should be like, let's say you're complimentarian and you, and you meet a woman and she's like, yes, I'm a pastor. You don't have to go like, oh, I don't, can I talk to them? I mean, it's like, it's a secondary issue, but okay. Yes, it's secondary, but that doesn't mean it doesn't matter. So the other problem is this, and this is why I'm doing this series. It's huge in its application in your lives, your ministry, women, your ministry, your marriage, or the whole, your whole church, your whole fellowship you may be deciding what churches you can or can't attend based upon their views on the topic of women in ministry. You might be deciding what teachers you can listen to or what role in ministry you can have or how to respond to your husband or your wife based on your views of these issues. So it's huge in impact, even though it's not impacting the gospel, it's still huge in impacting our lives in a practical way. Obviously, when there's the issue of women pastors, and that's complicated too, because what do you mean by pastor? We'll talk about all that as we go. There's also questions of women as deacons. I mean, now most people, when they hear women in ministry, they just think women as pastors, like a, like a lead pastor, Sunday morning services. But what about women as deacons or women as a youth leader? What if the what if the youth is 13 years old? Is that okay? What about uh, worship leaders, women as worship leaders? And do you have special sort of like caveats on them, their ability and how much they talk as they lead worship? Does it matter? What about women as um, non-pastoral teachers, right? So let me give you an example of this. Um, here is... Krista Bontrager, who is, she's fantastic. I mean, the content she's sharing is really important. It's really great. She's, she's thoughtful. She's articulate. She's, you know, a non-pastoral teacher. She does it online. She, she has a whole ministry where she does this kind of stuff or other people like uh, Jen Wilkin um, or Wilkins. I think it's Jen Wilkins. I'm just, this, this is someone who uh, Josh Lewis recommended to me. <laughs> so I just, I'll just throw his name out there. Um, Elizabeth Lewis Hall, another one uh, that you might throw out there. Um, th these these are people who have real ministries that are not pastoral exactly, not like not a, not a biblical elder role. How do you view this? Now, if you're egalitarian, all of these questions are easy. None, none of it matters. If you're complementarian, you realize that we need thoughtful and nuanced understandings of these things. Another example would be women theologians. Like look at Nancy Piercy. Nancy Piercy's brilliant. Like like she's actually brilliant. <laughs> like that's that's not that's not something you could say about everybody, and. She has all kinds of important and thoughtful things to share. She's written books that are very influential and pe many people have benefited from them. Are, are we supposed to like have an opinion about this? Or should we look at Nancy Piercy and make a judgment about the rightness or wrongness of the way she conducts herself based upon our views on this topic? Well, you're going to do it whether you like it or not. You're going to make a judgment. Let's make it an informed judgment. That's what I'm suggesting here. Um, or women as seminary teachers. There's a whole thing on that, right? John Piper thinks women shouldn't be seminary teachers. Others would say, no, they can. Yeah, because it's not the elder role. This is along the complementarian side. Or women who are just authors of other things, like my friend, Natasha Crane, who, believe it or not, this book that's on the screen there, Faithfully Different, it's the first book I've actually done a written endorsement for. Because I think it's a fantastic book. I mean, is that is that good that I did that? That, that I endorse this book. I mean, it was written by a woman. It's going to be used for the education of Christians. And I mean, let's let's just put all these issues on the table and let's talk about them. Let's work through them. And let's make sure that we apply them thoughtfully to our lives. What about a woman who's a guest speaker, say, on a Sunday morning? I don't know if Johnny Erickson Tata does Sunday mornings or not. I have, I have no idea. But let's suppose that she's a guest speaker at your church, really famous and very powerful speaker. And um, is that okay on a Sunday morning? Or do you relegate that to a different time? These are like, here's the thing. As a guy, these things never occur to me. But for a woman who's who's complementarian or for someone who's making decisions about someone else in ministry, these are questions you have to ask, even if you've already answered the elder question. So women who are bloggers, who are podcasters, women who have YouTube channels like Alisa Childers, who I, these are all women that pretty much everybody that I'm familiar with I'm recommending here is they're great sources. Right, well, Lisa Childers, great channel, 142,000 subscribers. I hope she gets a lot more. But how do we apply these topics to their lives, right? And I, I think Elisa is um, complementarian uh, in her views. So how do we process all this stuff? How do we apply it into our lives? She has more impact than probably any pastor she's ever sat under right now, which I'm cool with. But is scripture weighing in on this? There's also um, interviews. What if you just interview a woman, right? If you're complimentary, what you think? Here's me 
interviewing these different women who are sharing their different views on theology and apologetics and the Christian life. And they're, I'm interviewing them, right? They're the ones who are bringing the knowledge. Is that okay? Is that all right? A woman who's a board member of a, of a church or a, maybe a parachurch ministry or evangelist or conference speaker. Would you vote for a woman president? Would you, would you, I mean, based on whether she's a woman or not, forget the party and all that stuff, just based on she's a woman, does that affect your vote? Does that Im impact you in some way? What about a woman who goes to work while the man stays at home? All of these things start falling down on the issue of women in ministry. So it becomes this massive topic that we have to talk about all these issues. A woman as a business owner, a woman as a boss. Can you have a woman as a boss? Will you respect her the same way? Do you follow her orders? Or are you, you know, do you have a problem with that? <laughs> Can a woman correct a man's theology? There's, there's women out there who are like, look, there's a guy who said this weird thing. I'm not sure if I should speak up or how I should speak. right? And, and my problem is the, the uncertainty that affects people on these issues is unhealthy. And it causes a lot of, I think, a lot of women to hold back from things they could do, even though I am still complementarian. We'll talk about all that as we go. So can a woman uh, correct a man's theology? Can a woman serve communion? Um, so pr my point of bringing all these examples up is just to show you how big this issue is pragmatically how hugely it impacts people's lives in such a great diversity of ways that aren't just about church leadership. And we're going to get into all that. Another reason why I'm going to get into this is not just because it's hugely impactful, but because you're not sure. Um, you still have to make choices about it, even though you don't know the right choices to make. And, and I hated this for, for literally years. Women, you women who are listening to me now would, would message my ministry and you'd ask me, Mike, um, you know, I, I'm being told I have like a teaching gift. I, I want to like serve the Lord. Should I become a pastor in my local church? Should I try to seek that? I'm not sure about what scripture says. And you would get the very disappointing response from me, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know the right answers for sure on this because I am hugely intimidated to tell you from the distance we're at, you know, what you can, can and can't do or shouldn't, shouldn't do on an, on an issue where like you, I wasn't sure. This is why I devoted months to studying the topic. I actually, be honest with you guys, I wanted to become egalitarian. Like I, re I prioritized egalitarian scholars, right? Like the, the newest egalitarian scholarship. <laughs> this is the stuff I prioritized. I read Philip Payne's work and I read um, Linda Belleville and I've, I've read all of these sources, uh, even scholarly sources. There's the pop level ones, which are lousy, but <laughs> the, the scholarly ones thinking that I was going to get something really good. I have not changed my mind. Fundamentally, I'm complementarian. Um, I am still soft, complimentary, but the, the, that's not the point because you didn't just click this video to find out where I'm at. I hope you clicked it to find out where the Bible's at and how that applies to all the various situations of your life, but you're not sure. And I wasn't sure. And yet that doesn't stop you from having to make decisions. Here's you. I'm not sure, but I'm going to have to make a decision. Your church is like, should we allow this woman to do this ministry? We're not sure, but we still have to decide yes or no. And this is not a good place to be. So I want to provide more clarity, more certainty. And yes, there's been more written on this issue. Uh, it's hotly debated than any other issue, probably in Christian scholarship in recent years. Um, but we're going to get into all that stuff. So do a self-assessment like I did. Here's my recommendation. As we step into this, before I go over the seven errors that people, you know, to keep them from even reading the Bible on this issue, um, do a self-assessment and ask yourself this. Not what your view is, your egalitarian, complementarian, or unsure. Ask yourself this, what view do I want to have? Because you just want to be aware if there's if you are pulling yourself towards a direction. I did this assessment, and as I really was honest with myself, I was like, I want to be egalitarian. Maybe it's my culture. Maybe it's it's my perception of, of women's rights or something. I just want to be egalitarian. So I had to put that out there and recognize that. But as I read the, the egalitarians, it made it impossible for me to do that. So we'll, we'll get into those issues as we, as we go. So here's the path we're going to follow. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview. Today's video and all the videos that are coming in this series, today's video is, is about bypassing the Bible. It's how bad logic in the women in ministry debate keeps us from even reading the Bible. I'm going to get over those issues as soon as I finish this overview. Number two, the second video in the, in the series, I plan to be about Genesis. Does Genesis one through three, the creation account support male authority? And we'll get into all the debates on that issue. Video number three, Women in, in leadership in the Old Testament. Now, egalitarian scholars will often survey through the Old Testament to show you how many women have been in prominent positions and leadership positions throughout the Old Testament. You can think of like Deborah, right, of the, who was one of the judges. And so we're, we're going to look through those. We're going to follow this egalitarian sort of survey of scripture to examine those things. Um, Linda Belleville, one scholar, says that women are affirmed in spiritual leadership roles in the Old Testament 
and that it's neglected, this truth is neglected by many complementarians. I actually agree. This truth is neglected, but we need to understand it carefully and we'll go through it. Uh, the fourth video in the series will be about women in the New Testament. Are, are women apostles? Some claim there's a woman apostle. Some claim there's a bunch of women apostles. Um, are women elders? Are women deacons? Are women teachers in the New Testament times? We'll look at specific examples of women, not just explicit teachings, but like, here's a woman doing this thing. That looks like, does that look like leadership? Was Junia a female apostle? I've revisited this issue, which I've dealt with before. And if Junia was a female apostle, doesn't that prove the whole thing? If you can have a woman apostle, how can you deny her any other role in ministry? Number five, the fifth video in the series will be about there being no male or female in the Galatians passage, Galatians 3.28. It says that in Christ, there is not male. There's no male or female. Um, and this is like an ultimate proof for many egalitarians. Look, if there's no male or female, the whole debate is over. You can't have gender distinctions in roles. End of story. Um, because this is such a huge issue, it'll be a shorter video, but I will do a whole video on Galatians 3.28, the trump card for the egalitarian side. Um, then the sixth video in the series is going to be about our husbands, the head of their wives, our husbands, the head of their wives, most egalitarians will reject this or, and this is super important, redefine it. They would say, yes, head, but head doesn't mean what you think it means. This was one of the areas where I found the egalitarians scholarship to be severely flawed. Their actual scholarship, like that's not true. Um, and we're going to get into those issues. Kephale, the word kephale, the word head in the Bible. There's a massive debate on this. We'll dig into all that. You guys are going to love this. You've been asking for it forever. Video number seven, 1 Corinthians 11, the head coverings passage. I'm going to do a whole study on what is going on with the head coverings passage in 1 Corinthians 7. It does relate to the topic of women in ministry, but I also know how much you want this to be discussed. So we're going to get into it in great detail. Video number eight, 1 Corinthians 14, women being silent in the church. We're going to dig into that passage. We'll, there'll be other things we discuss, but we'll focus on that. Like um, women should stay silent in the church. They could ask their husbands at home. We'll dig into that in great detail. Then video number nine, notice how long I'm taking to get there. Video number nine, we're looking at the first Timothy two passage. This is the passage for the complementarians, right? Galatians, that there's no male or female. That's the passage for the egalitarians. But for the complementarians, the, the passage is first Timothy two. And we're going to dig into this. This is where he says he does not allow a woman to teach or have authority over a man. And so we're going to dig into that in great detail. Many complementarians see it as the ultimate passage. Um, and egalitarians will have very, very different interpretations of those passages. Very different. Now we're going to also dig into like, um, what was the nature of the, of the cult of Artemis in Ephesus at the time when Paul's writing? What was the role of women at the time? What is the meaning of the word authentic? And what is all, all of it? We'll dig into all of it. All of it. That's video number nine. And then number 10, a whole video we focused on application. After we've done this survey of all that scripture teaches about it, a whole video is just application. What should a woman, as far as we can tell, say yes to? when she's asked to do ministry and given ministry opportunities. What should she perhaps say no to, if anything? We'll dig with digging deep on all those issues. I'm going to be talking to more women, actually, as part of my research continues, um, to find out what they think about this and how they process these things. So yeah, when it's all done, I will put a video map down below. You guys can check out all the videos. It's all going to be free. It's also on BibleThinker.org. You will be able to find a playlist, you know, from the series that are there. It's all going to be completely free. So now... The meat, the meat. This is the thing I wanted to focus on today after that long, long intro <laughs> is that a lot of people are bypassing the Bible on this issue. I don't say that as a rhetorical, like, ha ha, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Let me give you examples and let's walk through the specifics of these things. It's going to take some time. Some people hold their views, not because the Bible, but because of philosophical beliefs they bring to the Bible on the topic of women in ministry. We can be committed to beliefs before we've ever consulted the scriptures. An example of this is how some people approach the Trinity. They don't believe the Trinity is real. They don't believe the, that the Bible teaches the Trinity. But, but when you really talk to them, you find out the reason is because they think the Trinity is philosophically impossible. No, you can't have three and one. You can't have three and one. That's not, it doesn't work. It's not allowed. And that rule is why they don't think the Bible teaches it. And you find this out when you really push and you ask some questions. Many people, this is how they approach the Bible on this topic. Women in ministry, there can't be limitations because A, B, C, D, because of these seven things. So before I give you the first major mistake, I want a word to the women in ministry. 
you're a woman in ministry, okay? That's you. And I'm going to talk to you directly real quick. I am not questioning your heart in any way, shape, or form. I am not, I'm not questioning, and this is super important to me, I'm not questioning your impact in ministry. I'm not, I'm not saying that there's something you've done that didn't work or didn't, that impact wasn't real or that somebody's life wasn't absolutely transformed by the service you've done. I am not calling you a false teacher simply because you're a woman who teaches. These are, these are major problems that I see that I will not do to you, and I hope no one else does to you, but it'll happen, I know. I have no control or authority over your life. Women in ministry. My name's Mike, and I have absolutely no control or authority over your life. Um, that's going to be supported throughout the scripture as I go through. I have none. Um, I just want to walk through scripture and try to share what I've read and have you think about these things and consider them for yourself. Uh, nor, nor do I conclude women shouldn't be in ministry at all. Not by I'm, I'm going to end up being pretty soft, what they call soft complementarian. You'll, you'll see. But women in ministry, if your answer to this question is, I know I'm called. I know I'm called. I'm called to be in ministry. I don't care what the Bible says. You've bypassed the Bible. This is one of the major bypasses. The first one I want to talk about, which is when you when you think your life experience answers the question of what the Bible says. This is an issue we make, we a mistake we make all the time in various other ways. My advice is for a woman who's in ministry, even if you feel like you're called, is set aside all those concerns for now. Just evaluate the passage in their in a, in each passage's historical and biblical context, so you can keep yourself from having conclusions from outside the Bible that you bring to the Bible and force into the text. So the first major mistake is when we say, I have a life experience that answers this question. You know, a woman pastor ministered to me the truth and love of God. So therefore, women in ministry is totally cool. I got saved listening to a woman pastor. I'm not saying you're wrong. I just want you to recognize this, Christian, as you approach the Bible with that belief, you have bypassed the Bible. You have your conclusion before reading the Bible. That is the issue I'm concerned about. That's the issue. If you, or and on the flip side, the complementarian could say, well, women have frequently been false teachers. Look at all the false teachers in history that were women. Here's what, here, my answer to you is this. Your experience should not guide your reading of the Bible. You have bypassed the Bible because you decided ahead of time what it was going to say. Look at problem number two, huge mistake number two, that um, women in ministry is simply a result of the evils of feminism. <laughs> okay. I know I, I told my wife today before I, a couple hours ago, I was getting ready for the stream. I said, I'm going to make half the world angry today. <laughs> but now that I'm thinking about it, I might make the whole world angry. Okay. Um, hear me out. I'm not saying whether that's true or false. What I'm saying is if you come to the table of the discussion of women in ministry, believing that the evils of feminism are the major issue here, you have bypassed the Bible and you can no longer let the Bible lead you to a place that you consider the evils of feminism. You've bypassed the Bible. Stow it for now. Set it aside. Examine the scripture. And then you can ask questions like, how do I explain my experience? How do I explain my concerns about, say, modern feminism or something like that? Issue number three. It is the evils of patriarchy that we're fighting here. Oh, it goes both ways. Okay. So the egalitarians will often say um, the what we see with the um, complementarians and some of them even refuse to call them complement. They call them traditionalists or patriarchalists. And they use these words in pejorative terms, pejorative ways. So the egalitarians, many of them I've read, okay, this is just permeating the writings of egalitarians. Not all of them, not everyone, but it's so frequent that you can't avoid it. It's the idea that the reason why there are gender differences in churches is because of the quote, evils of patriarchy, right? Privilege and power and position and all these, all these buzzwords. Here's the problem. Even if you're right, you can't read the Bible anymore because you've decided ahead of time that the Bible must lead me away from the evils of patriarchy. My biblical rule is evil patriarchy. I don't like it. I reject it. The Bible can't support it. Now I'm going to go open the Bible and find a way to support my conclusions. Now this has led some egalitarian scholars to come to one of two conclusions, uh, more of the evangelical ones who I've been reading. They're, they'll conclude, none of these passages teach anything like the evils of patriarchy. But there are plenty who also will conclude that the Bible does teach those things and the Bible's wrong and immoral in those ways. And I've full on read supposedly Christian scholars and leaders saying the Bible teaches it and it's evil. And I would say that's because you've decided ahead of time that you have a blanket condemnation on what you call the evils of patriarchy. And then you read the Bible with that belief 
firmly entrenched and immovable and you were not able to even consider letting it lead you wherever it would lead you. So this this is going to kill you. Whether you call it the evils of feminism or the evils of patriarchy, that's just a way of bypassing the Bible. Number four, and we're going to get into detail on this one. This one's getting philosophical. The fourth huge mistake is believing that equality of personhood rules out differences in roles. Um, let me try to unpack this one more carefully. Because this is a philosophical argument. You, you could read about it yourself. Uh, one of the sources I've got here is Good News for Women by uh, Rebecca Merrill Gruthuis, who's uh, very brilliant. She sadly recently passed away a few years ago. Um, committed Christian, loves the Lord, loves God, serves Christ, right? But but she did base one of her major arguments. In fact, probably her whole book is based upon something that I would consider a huge mistake as we approach this topic. And that is a belief that if women are equal in personhood, it rules out differences in roles. This is a philosophical belief that I come to the Bible with, right? So then the Bible's not allowed to change my mind on that. That's that's the belief I have firmly entrenched. So you can also read, if you want the short version of her argument, you can read chapter 20 in Discovering Biblical Equality. This is a brand new edition. Um, this book's been out for a while and it is a compl- it's, in, it's all egalitarian. Every scholar in it's egalitarian. And it's big okay <laughs> yes i read it and the um uh this is like the most cutting edge scholarship to be presented it just came out last november and i actually got an advanced copy so i could study it a little ahead of time but yeah in, in chapter 20 she goes into this in detail um basically her main point is let me get you back to my screen there we go um uh dr gruthwis her main point is that um one cannot possibly logically suggest that women are equal in person and different in role. And if that's true, well, then it doesn't matter what the Bible says. So let me walk you through how this goes. I'm repeating myself a few times here because I just want to make sure I make this point clear because I think it's actually, this is embedded in a lot of egalitarian writings. Okay, and it's one reason why I'm not egalitarian. It's because I'm not going to adopt these philosophies that force my Bible reading. I'm going to let the Bible breathe and go wherever it wants to go. So the author builds the case that saying women are not to exercise leadership over men, though she does speak really strongly as though the complementarian view is just that that um, any form of leadership is banned to a woman and that all men have authority over all women. And this is not what most complementarians view. It's certainly not, I think, a biblical view. But her point is that if you have that role, that women are not to exercise leadership over men, it makes women less human. It makes them actually less human. So she actually presents this in a the form of a syllogism. So here's the syllogism from 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 her book. Uh, actually, I think this is from uh, chapter 20 here in Discovering Biblical Equality. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to read through the syllogism here. She says, and it's you know, the syllogism is like three three statements. It's like premise one or idea number one, idea number two, and then the conclusion, which is number three there. So if the permanent, comprehensive, and ontologically grounded subordination of women is justified, then women are inferior persons. That's where she spends most of her time, is proving that that makes women less human, inferior humans. Uh, Number two, her point number two is that women are not inferior persons. And then three, her conclusion is, therefore, women's subordination is not justified. Right? If women are truly, fully human then you can't have any sort of role differences regarding authority. So first we'll analyze it. Then I'll explain why, even if you think she's right, you've totally bypassed the Bible. Like you're not reading the Bible anymore. And, I, and I'll use her words to demonstrate this. Um, so I agree with number two. Women are not inferior persons. I imagine you guys all agree. <laughs> You'll see when we get to Genesis next week, women are not inferior persons. Okay, this is important. But submissive roles and inferior personhood are not the same thing in my view. I think, for instance, a child has this has equal personhood, no inferior personhood, though they're submitting to the parent or an employee or whatever. So, um, but let's let's walk through some of these qualifications. He goes, if um, if a woman's role is permanent, comprehensive, ontologically grounded, these are three qualifications she has for how we view women's roles, and I think these are not true for complementarians. The complementarians aren't saying this. The, the Bible's not saying this either, in my opinion. But number one, um, is it permanent? Uh, no, it's not. Duration is limited. Uh, the, the, the duration of a woman's submission, if 
if a woman is called to submit in some capacity is limited. It's as long as marriage lasts, if it's in the marriage and it's in this speck of life. Uh, and then we have an eternity of ruling. And this is kind of like a biblical thing that you don't view this current life like it's your permanent state. It's really important that we don't. Jesus talks about this, the, 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 the issue of not, not um, storing up treasures on earth and not having your eyes upon the earth, but setting our eyes upon Christ and living for the kingdom of heaven. So this principle of, of it being permanent is, I don't think, biblical. Um, but why does duration matter? I'm not sure why duration matters. It's permanent. Okay, but, you know, for many other examples, we have all sorts of people. Like, if you're not an elder in your church, then at least for your entire life, you're submitting to someone else who is. So most Christians are in a permanent, for their life, season of submission to some other leader who might be kind of a, a punk, right? <laughs> it's possible. And this, this shouldn't affect your view of your humanity. That seems strange to me. So it's also not comprehensive. It's not comprehensive. Um, women's submission, even if complementarians are right on that theory, it's not comprehensive because it's, it's limited in scope. Now, let me describe what I mean here. Uh, on page 422 of Discovering Biblical Equality, um, Gruthuis says the following about women's submission. She says, quote, There is no area in which a woman has any authority, privilege, or opportunity that a man is denied. I'm going to read that again. This is her. This is what she, she seems to think complementarians are promoting. There's no area, none, in which a woman has any authority, privilege, or opportunity that a man is denied. And then I read that and I was like, this seems like such an overblowing of the issues. Like she can't choose what to wear, eat, laugh at, what hobbies to have. Like the woman, the man has authority over her laughter now. Uh, what commands to give her kids? Is she not an authority over her own children? Why is does male authority equal complete comprehensive control over area of every area of her life? It it doesn't. But that is how. Not just Dr. Gruthwis, who is an influencer, a major influencer in this egalitarian, you know, in in those circles. But it's how many other egalitarians put it too. What is what this? What's happening here is we're gonna we're gonna expand male authority to be the the largest, most monstrous it can be, so that it becomes intolerable. So that you decide ahead of time before you've read your, your Bible that it's completely unacceptable, and that's exactly what her whole argument seems to do. Um, a woman is to believe in and follow Christ in Scripture, right? Regardless of how many times a husband tells her not to, the husband's like, "Yeah, stop praying." She's like, uh, "No, I'm gonna do what I do what I want to do and pray." That's you have no authority over this. Like this is even on an egalitarian view. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, only the most extreme version of complementarianism might hold this view. And, and I would argue vehemently, I would hold hands with egalitarians and argue against those people as most complementarians would. And I think scripture would. So um, this is only an argument as it, as it is on your screen there. And I'm leaving it up because it's, it helps you consider it more. It's only an argument against some crazy extreme form of complementarianism that I, I wouldn't even call complementarianism. I would just call uh, super masculine authority Hulk style. All right. So Gruthuis regularly speaks as though all women are submissive to all men and ignores relational aspects of a wife submitting to one man, her husband, or everyone in the church submitting to the elders in that location in some respects, but not all. Instead, she speaks so generally that it's like every man has total, like as if I was just walking down the street and I was like, hey, woman, hey, come here, tie my shoes. Hey, woman, hey, go bake me some cookies. And I could just sort of command, it It, it feels really clumsy. Um, so it's not permanent. It's not comprehensive, even if you take egalitarian views. And it's not ontologically grounded. This is the other thing. Um, this is going to get a little complicated, but we have to. This this whole series is going to get a little complicated. Um, the phrase ontologically grounded means that a woman's submission is because of her nature. And it's it's not just related to her nature, but it's grounded in her nature. There's something in her nature that is making her have to be um, submissive in, in some way, in, to Gruthius in every way. But I don't know anybody who's saying that. Well, there's some wackos on the internet saying that. I'm talking about people I respect. <laughs> um, so the core of her argument here about ontology is that um, you complementarians are going to say, hey, you're, you're saying women are equal in role or equal in, sorry, uh, person, but different in role. But I'm telling you, if that role is connected to her person, then she's not equal. 
that doesn't work. This appears to be because of Gruthuis's definition of human. It's a little hard for me to really understand her argument in some ways. So I hope I communicate this well. She defines human this way. And I'll, uh, I'll come back to that syllogism in a minute. She defines human this way as uh, you having, you know, humans have higher rational functions, which include decision making. And that that's what it means to be intrinsically human, having higher rational functions, including decision making. So then in her argument, it seems that decision making in the form of being a leader of others is being human. That's how her argument kind of works. Then she reasons that not allowing women to do this sort of decision making by virtue of them being a woman is inherently dehumanizing. I don't follow personally. Um, all I can say is I don't see why human capacities, like I have the capacity to lead the country as president, but I'm not. Like, I don't really see how that's dehumanizing to me. Um, I don't see how unexpressed human capacities make somebody less human. I mean, anybody who dies in childhood is therefore less human because they have all these unexpressed capacities. It would seem, I don't know how you get around that. I mean, she would have answers to this. I just, I don't think they work personally. Um, I also don't see why leadership over men specifically is required to say that you're engaging in higher rational capacities. Like, why is it that I have to lead? And it's not even leadership over men because <clears throat> Gruthwitz doesn't think you have to actually do these things to be, she thinks you have to have the potential. You have to at least give, be given some kind of opportunity to do them if you have the skills. But I, I just think that's, I don't know why we're defining human that way, right? Because I feel like a lot of people are becoming less human now <laughs> as we do these things. Uh, let me give you some examples. The potential of a role being associated with everyone uh, being human has to have every particular role that involves higher capacities of humans. It just seems very confused. But an example of this is the Levites, okay? And, and Dr. Gruthwitz talks about the Levites specifically. So she responds to this argument. We'll get into that. The Levites were a subset of Israelites, right? One tribe. And they were permanently not, or they were permanently able to lead in certain ways, like in the temple and with teaching and stuff that Levites did that nobody else in Israel could do, right? Remember the guy who tried to touch the ark and he wasn't from the right tribe and he got struck down dead. Okay, so this is like, God's pretty serious about this. The Levites only can do these sort of temple things. This is a very high role in the uh, local, <clears throat> you know, it, the basically in Israel, right? In ancient Israel, under the Mosaic covenant, this is a very important role. And she says, Re Rebecca, her response to this is, but the Levites wasn't permanent because it only lasted for X number of hundreds of years and then it ended. And here again, I go, okay, but if we're going to allow countless generations to be permanently, right, under subjection to Levites and they have a role that nobody else can have because of their nature, they're Levites, it's connected to their nature. And we're going to say that's not permanent because it only lasted for countless generations. Well, then what... Why does it make it less human for women who, for this one temporary life, no woman has to deal with it for more than one chunk of 70 years or 100 years or however long it is, before you're set free and you're co-heirs with Christ and you're reigning in heaven, okay? So I don't, it doesn't work. It falls apart with the Levite analogy, in my opinion. Another thing about the Levites is the Levites, um, their role was not based on their ability, but it was connected to their nature, right? They were descendants of Aaron and, and descendants of Levi. So it was not by virtue of them being able to do it, or having a capacity, it was simply genetic. So wouldn't that make the Levites more human than the other Israelites based on her rules? But I don't think it does because I think her rules are wrong. A third thing about the Levites is it was a special role with authority, okay? Uh, Rebecca's response to this is to say that the, the prophets are a better example of that. The prophets had more authority than the Levites had. And I, I'm like, I feel like this is a red herring, like we're sort of changing the subject. Prophets are different than Levites, but they don't invalidate this point. The prophets were very rare. The Levites were the regular people spread throughout Israel. Remember, they had towns in different places within the within the tribes. And they were like the representatives of God in those local areas. You would go to the Levite, you go to the priest, you you'd go to inquire of the priest, the local priest. You wanted a Levite around you because he had that spiritual authority. The Levites really did have authority to teach and administer as spiritual mediators under the law. They, I mean, they had a really high role, more high than your local pastor does. Right? They, they had this high role. Um, prophets also were very hard to access. They were rare and you hard, and you probably lived your whole life as a Jew and never met one. So yet Levites are everywhere spread throughout the land. So I think this is a really good example, you know, of a defeater for her view. Um, Tom Schreiner says the following about Gruthuis's view. She's, uh, he says in, um, 
in the book. Uh, oh, I guess I have it on Kindle. Uh, two views on women in ministry. Schreiner says, uh, Gruthwis and other egalitarians are faced with the daunting prospect of saying that Israelites who could never serve as priests or are, are actually of less dignity and value than those who were qualified for the priesthood. Complementarians are spared such a problematic conclusion for we acknowledge that a permanent difference in role, the tribe of Joseph could never serve as priests, does not mean that those who cannot fill that role are of lesser worth or dignity. So Joseph's kids aren't less human than Levi's kids. That's all. Women are not less human than men just because different roles. This doesn't prove a complementarian views are right. All I'm doing is trying to remove an obstacle that will keep you from reading the Bible plainly. I'll give you a couple more quick examples of this. Um, only a son of David could be a rightful king of Israel. Only a son of David. I mean, this eliminates so many people from the highest authority in the land that, I mean, on Gruthwis's view, it seems to say that everyone else who's not a descendant of David is less human because they lack the potential to work their way into that top leadership role by virtue of their 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 skills, right? Instead, their nature disqualifies them from this high leadership role. So what I'm suggesting here is when you take her philosophy and you try to put it on the Bible, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. And it blocks you from reading the Bible. I mean, Israel is another example of this. Israel is a nation that's God's chosen people. Is that inequality? Other nations, even if they love God and they serve him skillfully, they cannot qualify as God's chosen nation. It's just Israel. You might say it's temporary, but it, but it, but if it's permanent for your life, your kid's life, your grandkid's life, your great-grand, your great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandkid's life is permanent for hundreds or thousands of years, that's, a, that's enough permanence to matter in this discussion, I think. Um, so there's a possibility that's completely overlooked by Dr. Gruthwis and many egalitarians. I'm using her because she's bringing a philosophical argument that many others will also support. And I'll put up her syllogism again. But there's a possibility that she ignores it's her syllogism. And um, it's that role can be associated with nature, but not grounded in nature. Right, role can be associated with nature, but not grounded in nature. Like, let me give you a, a crude example of this. Let's say that I I, I, uh, I stand in front of an audience and I say, everybody who is wearing buttons on your shirt, stand up and come with me. And maybe, maybe we all go to one thing and we do something and the rest of you do something else. Now you could say that 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 role that that role of coming with me was associated with having buttons on your shirt, but that doesn't mean that people without buttons are of lesser humans or they didn't count or they weren't valuable. It it was arbitrary in this case. What I'm suggesting not is that God's point about men and women are are arbitrary that that's the issue, rather that you can't say that differences associated with nature are inherently because of inferior natures. That seems wrong and Gruthwis rejects that possibility it's just it's rejected um now maybe uh men and women role differences is to be a picture of christ in the church that wouldn't be about better and worse or more and less human it would be about picturing the glory of christ or maybe it's better for society in general to have some kind of order and god's chosen this way for whatever reason or, or maybe god has other reasons that aren't about women being less human he just didn't tell you aren't these at least options for us Shouldn't we have these on the table instead of having the syllogism as our rule? Uh, but Gruthwitz rejects the possibility that this is about reinforcing God's order in the home or the church or picturing Christ or his relationship to the church. So those things are ignored. As far as I can tell, she doesn't talk about them at all. Let me go to her conclusion and show you this. This is now, even if you think everything I said was wrong, Mike, Gruthwitz is right. You're totally wrong about everything you said. I'm still going to push back on you really hard right now and say, you're blocking the Bible. You, you cannot read the Bible and in Gruthwis's own words, I want to show you, if you believe this, you will not be able to read the Bible. Here's her conclusion at the end of, um, I think this is at the end of Discovering Biblical Equality, chapter 20. Women's inferior role cannot be defended by the claim that it is ontologically distinct from women's equal being. I already talked about that. Um, in female subordination, being determines role and role defines being. Um, and now, I, again, I would disagree. I would say it looks to me like it could be that um, role is assigned as in association with being without being determining role, in which case the assignment from God is the determiner, not your nature, in which case her argument seems to collapse. But let's suppose that you think it works. And sorry if I'm being confusing to people, it'll get easier as we go, but we got to tackle some of these tough things. Um, 
Thus, there can be no real distinction between the two. If the one is inferior, so must the other be inferior. If, on the other hand, woman is not less than man in her personal being, then, and here's the highlighted part, neither can there be any biblical or theological warrant for a woman's permanent, comprehensive, and ontologically grounded submission to man's authority. Now, of course, I don't believe in woman's permanent, comprehensive, and ontologically grounded submission to man's authority, but even as a complementarian, but more important, the highlighted section, here's what I want you to notice. She brings the argument and in her conclusion, she just totally cards on the table. She's like, look, my argument is meant to tell you, you are not allowed to conclude with the Bible that the complementarian view is right. It's illegal. It's not allowed. This is how we bypass the Bible. Even if you agree with Gruthius, it kills your interpretation. It kills it. You have two options. One, the Bible supports my egalitarian views. Or two, the Bible is wrong. And these are the two sides that I often see come out of this kind of thinking. So again, it's like people saying the, that um, the Trinity is philosophically contradictory. Therefore, scripture can't correct me on the topic. Philip Payne says something related to this too. Philip Payne in his book, Man and Woman, One in Christ, um, big, long book. <laughs> um, he says that um, if we're equal in Christ, then we can't exclude anyone from leadership based on gender. Now, this is different because Gruth was her point is if you're equally human, then you have to be allowed all the same opportunities for um, authority. Uh, Payne's argument is different. Pain is about being equal in Christ, not equal in your nature, but equal in your salvation. So if you're equal in Christ, if women are equal in Christ, you cannot exclude them from leadership based on gender. Let me take you to a quote from Payne. He's a very influential guy on these topics. Um, when I asked egalitarians who influenced them, many of them said Philip Payne does. I went and saw him in person at the, um, the last ETS conference last year as well. So here's a quote from him. He says, if every member of a group is automatically excluded from leadership or teaching in the church, simply by virtue of their gender, Yes, that would necess necessarily violate equality. Um, now, I, I think, honest, I, I fear I I'm going to lose people in the weeds here of, of how complicated these ideas are. But I think, again, if we just say that it's based on God's assignment, hey, I want you to do this, I want you to do that, um, that doesn't have to be grounded in their nature or in their equality in Christ. It could just be based on their assignment. And then his argument would fall apart. So my short answer is that, is that it's it's about calling, not nature. Um, it seems to make, also his, his argument here seems to make elders more Christian than others. Um, like eldership is somehow, it, it, that's kind of a weird thing that I think is happening there. But the solution is, you know, my view of equality in Christ would be, and I think yours should hopefully be this too, is that only those things which every believer has can be something every believer needs in order to be equal in Christ. Not every believer is in leadership, authority, called to it, or even potentially going to be in it. So how do we make that part of what it means to be Christian? And that's what Philip Payne does. He makes you getting to be a, an elder part of what it means to be Christian. And that's just so weird to me. Like, like as a pastor, I'm like, dude, this is my Christianity is not being a pastor. <laughs> it's just weird. But worse than that, it kills Bible study. Only two options are left. The Bible supports your views as egalitarian because you've ruled it out through philosophy. Um, or you say the Bible's wrong. Kills, kills, kills Bible study. People can't read the Bible on these issues. Number five, here's the fifth huge mistake people make. Some say complementarianism leads to abuse and therefore it's bad. Um, this is probably the most common the most common thing I see. And it'll be a lot easier to follow. It won't be, It's not about philosophy, no syllogism to put on the screen. It goes like this. Abusive behavior towards women rules out differences in roles. Um, now, they don't say it outright, but that, that's, that's what it is. It's there. I'm going to give you examples of, of times where men have abused women, and it's going to show you that you can't, you can't put women in submission to these kinds of circumstances. Now, I, I've been a domestic violence counselor. I've worked close hand with people. I've been on the phone with a woman, real life, on phone with a woman who calls me in panic because I'm her husband's DV counselor to tell me that he's chasing them with a knife. They've locked themselves in a room and he's at the door pounding with a knife, right? I was the guy on the phone with her when she went, uh, climbed out the house, climbed out the window, took her kids to the, to the, um, to the police station. And I stayed on the phone with her, right? And she takes me to the police station. She reports her husband and then the cop didn't want to do a, a report. So they sent her back 
So she tells me they're sending me away. So I called and I talked to the station manager and said, I'm a DV counselor. You guys need to take this woman in and deal with her and help her. And, and I advocated for her. Look, what I'm trying to say here is as sad as this is to have to do, I'm not somebody who supports or endorses uh, abuse towards women, right? Um, I've, we have a rule in our marriage. We do not call each other names, not mean names, names like honey are okay. <laughs> um, it doesn't happen. I do not yell at my wife. My wife does not yell at me. That sort of thing just doesn't happen in our home. I know that sounds weird to some people, but we don't do that because I saw enough of that growing up. I was really worried to see it in my marriage and I don't want to see anything like that. Not supporting that stuff at all. But the type of story driven theology that says that these real horrific examples of abuse are simply the automatic result of the evils of complementarianism. They're A, I think it's false, and B, it keeps you from reading the Bible. The Bible cannot make you change your mind on these issues because you've decided and you are emotional about it and you are intense about it. Let me give you some examples of how this works. Um, one book that I'll point to, which is not very good <laughs> in, in, in any measure, as far as I can tell, is no offense to anybody. I'm just, I read a bunch of books, and, and of, of all of them, this is this is on this is towards the bottom of the list, right? Um, but Beth Allison Barr's book, "The Making of Biblical Womanhood: How the Subjugation of Women Became Gospel Truth." Um, in the introduction to her book, she does this sort of what I'll call story-driven theology. Okay, so if you can track with me on this. The intro, she talks about how her husband was fired after he challenged church leadership on the issue of women in ministry. That's on page three. It begins with this long story of just all the hurt that has come to her and come to women. Uh, that, that's the framing for the whole book. Uh, this sent them away from their church with salt in their wounds, pushing them into silence about what was really going on. I'm trying to share the story kind of the way she does. She's a better storyteller than I am, so it's more intense. But they had to leave the youth they discipled for 14 years. They lost friends over these issues. She says, and I quote from her introduction, I could feel the raw edges of grief, anger, and righteous indignation rising up inside me. And I just want to say this. If you approach the topic of women in ministry with raw edges of grief, anger, and righteous indignation, you're not going to be able to let the Bible guide and direct you here. I can't view the world through my pain. Like you can't look at the world this way. If, if you've been abused by a husband, you can't then look at marriage through that abuse. If you've been hurt by a church leader, you can't then look at church as a whole through the hurt, through the pain you've experienced through that church. It, it's, it's just, it's, it's going to mess up our ability to think clearly about things and we'll only see bathwater and we'll never see babies. You know, that's just the way it is. So she goes on, uh, Beth Allison Barr sees the hurt and pain that she experienced and which is in countless other stories. And she, that she tells these stories throughout her book and she sees it as caused by complementarianism. And she's very clear. You cannot separate the issues. The abuse is complementarianism. These two are the same thing. You will not read her book without feeling it. Complementarians are bad. Their views have hurt people, especially women. That is the main theme of the book. It's not really about theology so much or about understanding scripture in context. It's, it's about telling stories to create theology for you by viewing an issue through the lens of pain. Pain can teach us. Pain can be helpful. It can also confuse us. It can also distort our perspective on things. And so we just have to be aware of that. Let me give you an example of how this works, how stories are used to overrule your thinking. Um, this is, this is a story about a complementarian student she has, and she's, she's a, she's a, uh, a well-educated, um, professor, um, teaching at a university, right? And so Beth Allison Barr's teaching and she has, um, I think I have the quote. No, I don't have the quote. Yeah. I'll just read it to you. So in her book, she has this, uh, on page 16 and 17, and she says one student was particularly vocal. This is about her this kind of punk student she had. He was theologically conservative and expressed concern about my choice to continue teaching as a wife and mother, especially as a pastor's wife, because she's teaching at a university. He challenged me so often in the classroom that I took to rewriting lecture material, trying to minimize his disruptions. I wasn't successful. Once the student suggested that I clear my teaching material with my husband before presenting it to my classroom, this both angered and unnerved me. It angered me that he thought it appropriate to suggest that I submit my teaching materials to the authority of my husband. It unnerved me because every semester I worried about how my vocation as a female professor clashed with conservative Christian expectations about female submission. 
so um uh, i mean her student was 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 i mean he was, he was a young punk right like he's just a young like kid who's up on his high horse being being rude and saying weird things but her point isn't that that's some weird young guy her point is that's comp that's conservative christianity like i want you to view all of christianity through the lens of the pain of this experience let me show you how this is the case as you read on in her book you get to page 17 and 18 this is just immediately after the story of the kid and she's responding now to russell moore who wants to say that complementarianism isn't abusive and it's not the same thing as patriarchy that there is such a thing as a non-abusive role differences between men and women she's very against that and she's going to use the story of this kid story-based theology to reinforce it uh, let me read from her uh book now she says while russell while he russell moore writes that scripture demolishes the idea that women in general are to be submissive to men in general which i agree with he explains wifely submission as cultivating quote a voluntary attitude of recognition toward godly leadership thus russell moore according to beth allison barr thus his general attitude remains unchanged women should not submit to men in general that's pagan patriarchy but wives should submit to their husbands that's christian patriarchy nice try i thought listen to how she handles how she overrules what he's saying nice try i thought tell that to my conservative male student because that student considered me to be under the authority of my husband he was less willing to accept my authority over him in a university classroom no matter how much more wants to separate pagan patriarchy from christian patriarchy he can't both systems place power in the hands of men and take power away from women both systems teach men that women rank lower than they do both systems teach women that their voices are worth less than the voices of men page 17 and 18 in the making of biblical womanhood all nuance is gone all distinctions are gone her point look here's what i honestly see to be super honest with you guys i see someone saying pagan patriarchy is messed up i'm gonna make a case that no matter what you say any version of christian like role differences between men and women it just is messed up pagan patriarchy and if you try to tell me hey look i've got these verses i've got these policies i've got these rules i've got these these beliefs i've, I've got all the scripture i'm going to tell you nice try tell that to my story my story overrules all of that stuff and becomes the policy for how i'm going to view these issues through the lens of pain this is not just Beth Allison Barr. Um, Discovering Biblical Equality has an entire chapter on the topic. This book, again, premier, brand new, well-respected egalitarian scholarship. Chapter 28 in their book says, Complementarianism and Domestic Abuse. A social scientific perspective on whether equal but different is really equal at all. And the main argument of this chapter is that domestic abuse is the result, in part, of complementarian views. That complementarian views cause domestic violence. Now, again, I've, I'm probably more experienced in the realm of domestic violence than anybody who's in this written this book. I, mean, I imagine I am. I've literally worked with abusers for years in in you know 52 week uh, domestic violence programs and anger management and stuff like that, and um. And so, I mean, yeah, I very much have a heart for it and very much care about those issues. But let me um, um, take you to the, um, to the conclusion so you can get the point that they're trying to make. It is no longer credible to simply state from the pulpit that complementarianism, due to its loving kindness, does not facilitate gendered violence. It is by definition a system of permanently unequal power distribution with rigidly defined gender roles. These are some of the conditions under which abuse is known to flourish. Complementarianism, even if it could be enacted in perfect loving kindness, creates not only systemic discrimination, but implicit and explicit biases that disadvantage women. So um, if we view let me just respond first to the argument and then I'll respond. I say the same thing I keep saying this whole video, which is why this is going to kill your own understanding of scripture. You can't let the Bible lead you for obvious reasons. You, you definitely understand by now in the video. But um, if we take this view that complementarianism, because it it is it coincides with domestic violence, and it does, there's it, in a sense it does, um, 
that therefore it is ca is causally related to domestic violence. Therefore, it's in fact wrong and we have to reject it. I mean, do you realize if you apply this policy to other things, you start to see that there's something wrong with it. Like you start to smell, it doesn't pass the smell test. So government has been involved in the mass murder of people throughout history. Millions and millions and millions of people mass murder without discrimination, just killing people and murdering people and disadvantaging people and oppressing people where you, where you have that kind of oppression, there's always government taking place. There's always government there. So government is a system of unequal power. Is it not? Does it not, does it not systemically cause unequal power where you have police over here and you have authorities over here and you have laws and the lawmakers don't always represent the people and this sort of thing. You would have to then argue that all, if, if you're consistent with discovering biblical equality here, you'd have to argue that all government is inherently evil and has to be done away with because that's the view of complementarianism. It's unequal, therefore it has to all be done away with. Um, church authority is the same thing. I could give you example after example of church abuse from people in church authority. I just made a video a few days ago about this horrible pa pastor, false prophet guy who's radically abusing his congregation. I Oh my goodness. Ed Citronelli. I mean, goodness gracious can't stand that stuff. But if we take example after example of all those hurts and make them our vision for how we view church authority, we will only see an oppressive, systemically evil organization. We have to just demolish church authority, demolish government, demolish role differences between men and women. Bosses, bosses have often been at workplaces. They've been the source of oppression and abuse and harm and hurt towards their employees. Shouldn't we abolish boss and employee differences? Right? Humans abuse authority, but God can still show us how to do it right. And we should pay attention carefully when he does. So there's a baby, there's the bathwater. These arguments are all about, there is no baby. There's just bathwater. And I think, um, I think that abuse can be addressed without it being proof that egalitarians are right in their conclusions. They can be right, but let them be right because of biblical arguments, not because of these extra biblical things. Uh, this is what I see constantly. This is probably the biggest reason why I didn't become egalitarian because I didn't swallow these things on my way to studying scripture. If you swallow this, you're going to end up egalitarian no matter what. But if you don't, you're at least going to be open to leading you, to the Bible leading you wherever it wants to lead you. So abuse can be addressed without it proving egalitarian views. But if it is, but if, if abuse itself proves egalitarians are right, it bypasses the Bible, my biggest issue here. I can't think biblically if I've decided ahead of time what the answer is going to be. This is the real problem with this. We've decided what God has to say. Next, we find a way for God to say it, which is, I think, why a lot of egalitarian arguments are really stretched. And I mean, you'll see, guys, I wanted to be egalitarian. I lost a lot of respect for the side. Not the people exactly, but for that position as I studied this stuff. And I'll get into all those details. Um, yeah. Yeah, this would be like um, saying uh, divorce rates and dysfunctional homes are caused by egalitarians. Therefore, um, egalitarians are wrong. Okay. Again, we're just bypassing scripture here. We want to go to the scripture. Okay, problem number six, we'll go quicker now. There's a similar problem here, and that is that thinking submission is inherently evil. Um, submission is kind of a bad word in our culture. It was not a bad word in biblical culture or time or even in the Bible. Submission is considered a good thing. We're told to submit to our elders, for instance. Like this is something you just, elders being the leaders of the church that are that are guiding and directing the church, we're told to have a sub submissive attitude. I, I cannot imagine a modern pastor going and saying, hey guys, you should really submit to your elders here at the church. Like most pastors would feel immediate tension because they'd realize the culture hates this word. <laughs> and so um, they'd find another way to say it. So yeah, um, this belief though permeates egalitarian writings. It's all over the place. It's the unproven, unexplained assumption that if you, that submission's evil automatically. And this is various ways of saying that, that I've already covered. Um, Linda Belleville is so opposed to submission. One of the leading scholars here, she's so opposed to it that she says that nobody had authority in the early church. Jesus didn't have authority. The apostles didn't, nobody had authority. And so her, her argument is women don't have authority because nobody has authority, but everybody can be in every role. It, it's a strange argument. We'll get there eventually. Uh, but scripture can't correct you if you think submission is inherently wrong, oppressive, and just plain bad. It's not allowed to correct you. Number seven, the last one is this. And there's, and I'll tell you the things I won't do in this series. <laughs> well, I'm not going to pull punches, obviously, but I'll be straight with you. Um, so number seven, when you pick one passage to rule the rest or let the rest 
um, uh, rule the one. When you basically posit contradictions in the Bible effectively. Um, and I see it on both sides. So the complementarians will pick 1 Timothy 2. I don't allow a woman to, to teach or have authority over a man. That's the whole debate. It's over. That The whole debate's there, boom. But there's no perspective on like, well, what does that teaching mean? Are there other examples of, of women teaching in the Bible? What can we learn from those things? They're not expanding out to read all of the Bible on the issues. Sometimes, not all, sometimes complementarians, they throw up the one verse out of context and then it becomes uh, too strong of a rule without any flexibility, without any balance, without any nuance, and without the ability for other scriptures to come in and bring in some course correction. Egalitarians do this with Galatians 3.18. Well, there's no male or female in Christ. That end of end of the discussion. That's the end of discussion. So um, I like what Thomas Schreiner said about this. He says, I do not believe the issue relates to which texts are more fundamental or which texts control the discussion. Such a view assumes that one set of texts functions as a prism by which the others the other set of texts is viewed. And again, we need a unified look at all of scripture. And we're going it, to, it's, there's such a beautiful balance. Whenever I've taken a topic and covered it in great detail, I get like this unified look and I see how the Bible balances out all these issues. Like when I did a big study on the word, on the topic of alcohol, there's, there's the positive and the negative passages. And when we embrace all of it, we get this really thorough nuanced view. Women in ministries like that too. When we take all the scripture and we examine it all in great detail, I think there's a huge benefit that we have there. So I'm excited about it for that reason. We're going to go into all the scripture. Now there's three things I'm not going to do. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, we're getting close. We're getting close to being done. Each video is going to be different lengths depending on the topic. But um, three things I won't do. I will not submit scripture to culture. This is extremely tempting. I want to build bridges. Some of you might, you know, might be someone watching who's thinking like, well, I'm not a Christian, but if they don't, if they don't have women in leadership in every capacity, then I, I don't want to be one. I, I really want to build bridges with you but I'm not going to play those games. I'm going to let scripture be scripture. I'm not going to submit it to culture and I'm not going to do it on either way. I, I don't want to submit it to uh, me having been raised in a complementary environment as a Christian. I mean, not as a child, but since I came to Christ and I also don't want to be looking at the world. I mean, I think something like 80% of the churches in my area have women pastors. I live in Southern California guys. Okay. So both sides of culture are pulling me in different directions. I just don't want to do that. I won't submit scripture to culture. I also won't play games with polemic or moral pressure. I just want to have an accurate understanding of biblical passages. So you can expect the whole series to be a lot easier to listen to than most other stuff on this topic because they just load it with so much like intense uh, you know, stuff. Um, it should be easy to listen to. We're going to do Bible study is what we're going to do. I'm also not going to be God's PR department. Here's the third thing. I'm not going to be God's PR department. Um, there's too much concern that we have for making Christianity palatable that causes us to not express things the way God does in, in his word. And we miss them the focus of his word. Uh, we avoid certain truths and we fail to confront false beliefs because we're trying to make it palatable. This video series is for people who want to submit to God. So that's the price of entry. You need to be able to say right now, if you're going to listen to this series, if the Bible does affirm some form of complementarianism, I will submit to that and I will trust that it is a good thing. It is good. You also need to be able to say, if the Bible teaches egalitarian views, I'm willing to champion those views, change my mind and tell others about it. So much of this debate is based on these other errors though that bypass the Bible. So hopefully we've bypassed those and we can get to scripture. The next video in this series I'll do next Monday is on Genesis one through three is female subordination uh, in the creation or the fall. Um, if so, how um, Adam was made first complementarians will say, but egalitarians will say, but Eve was the climax of the creation. Adam named Eve. The complementarians will say, but others will say, but that's not him exercising authority over her. That's just him recognizing his equal. Uh, the complementarians say Adam's blamed for the fall, not Eve, but the egalitarians say, but Eve's given dominion over the earth, just like Adam is in Genesis chapter one. Um, Eve is told her husband will rule over her, the complementarians say, but the egalitarians respond, but that's a curse. We shouldn't propagate the curse. And maybe it never meant that in the first place. We're going to hear both sides on all these kinds of issues and more. So you're going to hear all the best arguments, hopefully. And make your own choices in the end. So welcome to my Women in Ministry series. I do not expect to get tons of views on this kind of content as it goes on. We'll see. I really don't care. Um, for those who need the in-depth, thoughtful, 
careful walkthrough exposed to both sides of the arguments. I know this will bless you. And um, I can't wait to hear what you think about it in the coming weeks. So God bless you. I'll see you guys on Friday for the live Q&A, which will be at 1 p.m. Pacific time, as it is pretty much every week.